welcome to the Bonillac Public Library's History at Home program. Before we get started, I just want to let you know that we have bathrooms and bubblers around the corner if you have, have to um, leave, that's okay. Um, we have a display of books outside our door and they can be checked out. Um, right now we have our summer reading program going on at the library and you can sign up um, for this program and win prizes for reading. Um, you can either sign up online or you can go to any of the service desk and a staff member will get you your first reading card. No library card is required. On the card, <coughs> sorry about that, on the card mark off a circle for every 30 minutes you read and every kind of reading counts from newspapers, magazines, books, audio books, and even counts like when you're reading to grandchildren or reading to children, it all counts. Um, so when the card is full, which is approximately five hours of reading, um, you bring it back to the library and you can get an instant prize and you get your next card. And we repeat this up to four, a total of four cards. So I just wanted to let you all know about that. Now for tonight's <coughs> program, um, rubbing shoulders with the likes of Mickey Mantle, Yogi Berra, Roger Morris, and Roberto Clemente, Bill Guilfoyle brought home story after story of a baseball's golden era. Bill's brother, Tom Guilfoyle, who is here tonight, will share some of these tales and baseball stories you've never heard before. Tom Guilfoyle of Bonillac attended Notre Dame <coughs> where he played varsity tennis and graduated with a degree in journalism. After working for an advertising agency in Milwaukee, he joined his father's insurance agency in 1960. He spent 42 years as president of the agency before retiring. He and his wife, Jeannie, have four children and seven grandchildren. So I welcome Tom Gilfoyle. Thanks, Nancy. For someone who loved baseball as much as my brother did, he couldn't have found a more appropriate career. Bill graduated from Notre Dame in 1954, and while he was in school there, he became acquainted with Bob Fischel, the director of public relations for the New York Yankees. Bill spent the next, next three years after he graduated on active duty as a naval officer assigned to a destroyer escort in the Atlantic Ocean. His home port, though, was New York City, and when he had leave time during the baseball season, Bob Fischel saw that he got tickets for the Yankee games. A couple years after his naval duty was completed, Bob Fischel called him and offered him a job with the Yankees as Fischel's assistant. Bill jumped at the opportunity, and he and his family headed east to join the Yankees in 1960. In 1960, the Yankees were a great team with Mickey Mantle, Yogi Berra, Whitey Ford, Roger Maris. In fact, the first five years that Bill was with the Yankees, the Yankees were in the World Series. Mantle was a legendary player, but Bill remembered him as a team player, more concerned about the success of the Yankees than he was about his own statistics. Mickey was probably most remembered for his prodigious home runs. The Guinness Book of World Records lists one of Mantle's home runs at Washington as a world record, 545 feet. They also list another one of his home runs in Detroit as going even further, 643 feet, but the distance was measured later, and so it apparently is not an official uh, statistic. In 1962, uh, Mantle was uh, hurting greatly. He had trouble even walking. And um, Bill was in the locker room with uh, a fellow by the name of Maury Allen, who was a, a sports writer. And uh, Mantle was getting his legs taped for the game that day. And Allen said, Mickey, why don't you ask Ral Ralph Hoke, who was a Ralph Hoke, who was a manager of the Yankees, to let you sit out the rest of the games until the World Series, because the Yankees had already qualified for the World Series and the games really didn't mean much. <clears throat> Mickey said, the Yankees don't pay me to sit on the bench. 
And that was kind of his attitude. He wanted to be contributing all the time. Roger Maris in 1961 was climbing after Babe Ruth's home run record. Ruth had the record of hitting 60 home runs in one year back in 1927, and nobody had reached that level since that time. Well, Mantle was, uh, Maris was getting closer and closer, and Mantle was hitting a lot of home runs that year as well. But in the midst of all the stress of and the uh, papers, every day filled with news about whether he got another home run or didn't get one. Um, Bill's secretary came in and she said, there's a gentleman out here who would like to talk to Roger Maris. So Bill went out and met with the fellow and the, the man told him, he said, I'm a farmer from Iowa. And when the Yankees were in spring training, I was in Florida and I visited with Roger and asked him for a bat. And he said he, he didn't have many bats in spring training but that if I, if I come to Yankee Stadium to ask for him and he'd give me a bat. So he said, I came for my bat. <laughs> well, with all the stress that Maris was under with this home run goal, Bill hated to bother him, but he said, I'll see what I can do. So he went to the locker room and found Maris and he said, Roger, there's a gentleman out here who says that you told him you'd give him a bat, he's from Iowa. And Mary says, I remember him in spring training. I did promise him a bat. And he rummaged around in his locker and pulled out a bat and he said, here, give this one to him. <laughs> and Bill thought that said a lot about Maris that he would uh, take the time to uh, honor a, a promise that he made when he was under such stress. Uh, one play that That was my brother. Okay. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. And there's Mickey Mantle. Leona was my mother and he sent a photograph picture to her. And there's Maris. And there's Yogi Berra. Bill said one of the best fielding plays he saw when the Yankees were in the field and the, the other team had a runner on first base and the batter bunted. Well, the third baseman and the first baseman came charging in to field the bunt. Second baseman went to cover first. The shortstop went to cover second. Well, the guy in first base was pretty fast, and he got to second base, and he looked, and there was nobody on third. The third baseman, the third baseman had gone to home, and the, second, the shortstop was covering second. So he took off at third. Yogi Berra tagged him out at third. The catcher just showed that Vera's baseball skills that he realized that third base was going to be open, but the guy didn't expect the catcher to be taking him off at third. <laughs> There's another Yankee story of uh, this old timer was a really died in the wool Yankee fan, <clears throat> and somebody asked him, why, why do you like the Yankee so much? And he said, well, I'll tell you, when I was a kid, I, I loved baseball. I was about 13 years old and I'd save up my money till I had enough to buy a ticket. And I'd take the bus to the stadium and uh, every time I had enough money to buy a ticket. Well, he said, I, I stopped to realize that if I hitchhiked instead of taking the bus, <laughs> I'd have some money left over to buy some food at the ballpark. So he said, I started hitchhiking to the, the games. He said, one day I was I was on the road hitchhiking and a cab pulled up. The cab driver says, where are you going, son? He said, I'm going to Yankee Stadium. He said, well, hop in the cab, hop, hop in the back, that's where we're going. So he said, I got in the back seat and there sitting next to me was Babe Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> and Babe Ruth talked baseball with me all the way to the stadium. And when we got there, he got out and he walked me into the player's entrance of the stadium and I, I thanked him and started turning away and he said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to buy my ticket. He said, not today, son, you're sitting in my box. And he got a usher to take, take him to Babe Ruth's private box. So he said, 
That's why they like the Yankees. <laughs> Bill went to Mickey Mantle's funeral in 1995. His funeral was in Dallas. And he met Bobby Richardson there, who was the second baseman for the Yankees on the Mantle teams. And uh, Bobby Richardson told him the story that after he had retired, he moved back to his hometown of Sumter, South Carolina. And he'd organized a home run derby among his, the local people and uh, with the proceeds to go to the YMCA. Well, he got a call one day and it was Mantle on the phone. He said, Bobby, how come you didn't invite me to your home run derby? And Richardson said, Mickey, I didn't think you'd have any interest in going. It's just a bunch of local guys. Mickey said, I'll be there. So you can imagine that the profits from a fundraising drive uh, <laughs> greatly exceeded what they were looking for. <laughs> you know, there was a picture of Ty Cobb was visiting Yankee Stadium one day and so Bill posted him. You know, baseball seems to have more characters than than other sports. Maybe it's because baseball has been around longer. But there are really some characters in the history of baseball. Casey Stingle was one of them. He was a New York Yankee manager and later he became manager of the uh, New York Mets. <coughs> Mets. And uh, someone asked him, Casey, what's the secret of being successful for a manager? He said the secret of being successful of a manager is to keep the five players who hate you away from the 20 players who are undecided. <laughs> <laughs> Leo DeRocher was another major league manager. He was a manager of the Brooklyn Dodgers. And in 1941, the Dodgers were in a pennant race. And uh, DeRocher needed uh, another catcher to warm up the bullpen pitchers. So he pulled a young ball player out of one of the minor league teams, a fellow by the name of George Pfister. And Pfister joined the Brooklyn Dodgers and uh, spent all of his time in the bullpen warming up the, kit, uh, the pitchers. <clears throat> well, as luck would have it, the Brooklyn Dodgers clinched the National League pennant with about five days left in the season. So George Fister stayed in the bullpen, and one day the bat boy came out and he said, Fister, DeRocher wants to see you. So Fister ran to the dugout, and DeRocher said to him, Fister, get your gear on, I'm putting you in the, in the game. And Fister said, Mr. DeRocher, I'm not even on the roster. <laughs> and DeRocher said, Fister, you know that, and I know that, but nobody else knows that. <laughs> he said, and if you want to tell your children someday that you played in the major leagues, get your gear on. <laughs> so there's an encyclopedia of baseball over there, and if you look in there, you'll find George Fister's name. It was in playing for the Brooklyn Dodgers for one game, at bat twice, and no runs and no hits. <laughs> Another character was Dizzy Dean. Dizzy Dean, after he finished playing, uh, became an announcer. And one day he was at the uh, Yankee Stadium doing the play-by-play. -play. And Bill was in the broadcast booth with him, I, I suppose to help him with pronouncing some of the names. And uh, as they were <coughs> sitting there waiting for the game to start, Bill said, you know, my dad is never never misses a game of the week on Sundays. And uh, so Dizzy said, well, what's your father's name? And Bill said, Walter. So Dizzy started announcing the game in about the fifth inning when, when the teams were changing sides. He said, I'd like to say hello to my good friend, Walter Guilfoyle, back in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. <laughs> How are you doing, partner? <laughs> I think my dad fell out of the Davenport. <laughs> Another character was Charlie Finley, who was the owner of the Oakland Athletics. And uh, Charlie was crusading to 
for the for baseball to start using orange baseballs because he said they could be seen better, especially at night. Well, somebody asked Bob Euchre what he thought of that. And Euchre said, well, it might not be a bad idea, but he said, you know, baseball are covered with horse hide. And he says, I don't know how you're going to find that many horses with jaundice. <laughs> <laughs> and you'd have to include Yogi Berra in the class as one of baseball's characters. Um, Yogi had some sayings, and it would be impossible to describe them, so I'll just read a few of them to you. These are sayings from Yogi Berra. Nobody goes there anymore. Nobody goes there anymore because it's too crowded. <laughs> Number two, never answer anonymous letters. <laughs> If the people don't want to come to the ballpark, nobody's going to stop them. <laughs> Half the lies they tell about me aren't true. He bats from both sides of the plate. He's amphibious. <laughs> Always go to other people's funerals or they won't come to yours. <laughs> if you don't know where you're going, you couldn't end up someplace else. And my favorite one was, it ain't so much the heat, it's the humility. <laughs> Sounds like Yogi. I guess of all baseball characters, uh, the, the one that should consider the biggest character was uh, Bill Beck, who owned the St. Louis Browns. And the St. Louis Browns, other than one year, were pretty... a team that didn't do very well. And uh, so Bill Beck would try to find all kinds of uh, promotions to bring people into the ballpark. So one year he hired a 26-year-old player named Eddie Goodell. And Eddie Goodell was a midget. He was three feet seven inches tall and he weighed 65 pounds. <laughs> They said his strike zone was about one and a half inches. <laughs> well, Beck hired him in secret because he, he was sure that if baseball found out about it, they'd find some reason not, not to let Eddie Goodell play. So he had the batting coach work with him, showing how to hold a bat and where to stand in the batter's box. And he said, whatever you do, don't swing at a ball. So one day they announced from the public address <coughs> now batting for the St. Louis Browns, Eddie Goodell. And Eddie came out with number one eight from the back of his <laughs> uniform. <laughs> and the umpire said, no, this isn't going to happen. So the coach had all of the documents that he was a, uh, had a contract for Eddie Goodell. And so the umpire said, play ball. Well, the pitcher threw balls underhand, and he walked him on four pitches. <laughs> So that was the last game that Eddie Goodell played in because the president of the National League the next day voided his contract. Just as a sideline, Eddie Goodell didn't live very long. He, he died when he was 35 years old. And I just saw recently somebody paid $6,700 for one of his autographs. In 1970, Bill left the Yankees and joined the Pittsburgh Pirates. Danny Murtaugh was a longtime manager of the Pirates in the 50s and 60s. The uniform I have on is his 1964 uniform. Um, it seems like every time I put it down, it shrinks a little. <laughs> but. Um, Murtaugh was a great manager, and he, he brought uh, the Pirates to the World Series in two, two different years. Um, while Bill was with the Pirates, a company in Pittsburgh that made aluminum bats came to Bill and asked him if he said, I know that aluminum bats aren't permitted in professional baseball, but we've got a new bat, and I wonder if one of your ball players would try it out. So Bill took the bat, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and he gave it to Richie Zisk, 
the second baseman for the or shortstop for the Pirates. Um, in the history of Three River Stadium, in all the years, four balls had been hit on the, in the upper deck. Well, in Batty, <coughs> Batty practice, Richie Zisk hit five balls in the upper deck. Um, the reason that baseball won't permit aluminum bats, number one, is there'll be too many home runs, and number two, there'll be too many dead pitchers <laughs> because the bat comes off the ball comes off the bat so quickly that the pitcher couldn't defend himself. Lloyd Weiner was a member of the long old time member of the uh, Pittsburgh Pirates. He was also in the Baseball Hall of Fame, but he played for the Pirates in the 1920s. And he told Bill a story from the 1927 World Series against the Yankees. He said he came out of the Yankee Stadium after the one game and saw a big crowd over by the, the Yankee exit. And there were all these kids hanging around Babe Ruth who were signing autographs for them. Well, Wainer stood around for a little while and watched and then he went back to the, the team hotel. The next day when he came to the ballpark, he, he saw the security guard who had been there the night before he said, I was just curious, how long did Babe Ruth stay in the ballpark signing autographs? And this guy shook his head and he said, after he was there an hour, I went and got a chair for him. That was at six o'clock. He said he was there until 10 o'clock until every kid got an autograph. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill's first day at the <clears throat> with the Pirates was in spring training and he uh, he was going into the locker room and one of the uh, Pirate sports writers saw him and he asked him if he'd arrange for him to give an uh, interview to, to this writer. So Bill said, well, I haven't even met Clemente yet, but I'll see what I can do. So he, he went in the locker room and introduced himself to Clemente and mentioned that the sports writer had asked if he'd give him an interview and apparently Clemente had not get al gotten along at all with this sports writer which is probably the reason that, that he asked Bill to intercede for him. So Clemente went into a tirade about this, about this uh, writer and finally he stopped and he said, would it be important to you if I gave him an interview? Bill said, well, this, I, this is my first day on the job. I'm trying to get along with everybody. And he said, for you, I will do it. And so he gave an interview to the guy, and he and Clemente became very good friends. Um, Bill was responsible, my brother was responsible for, for one Pittsburgh Pirate record in, in the 1972 season. Uh, it's toward the end of the season with four or five days, five days left in the season, Clemente got his 3,000th hit. And he was, he had a lot of injuries and they, both he and the manager, Bill Bearden, decided that he'd sit out the, the last four games of the year. The, the Pirates weren't in contention for the World Series and the games really didn't mean it much. <clears throat> So Bill was looking at the records and he discovered that both Clemente and uh, Hannes Wagner, an old time Pittsburgh player, had both played in 2,422 games. And so he went to Clemente and he said, Roberto, if you play in one more game, you'll set a new record for Pittsburgh Pirates. Nobody's ever played in that many games. Well, Clemente said, I've got all next year to do that and I'm just gonna sit out these four games. So Bill wasn't satisfied with that and he went to Bill Bearden, the manager, and told him that story. And so Bill was very pleased about the seventh inning when the public address announcer said, now playing outfield for the Pittsburgh Pirates and setting a new record for the most games ever played by a Pittsburgh Pirate, Roberto Clemente. And uh, just as a postscript for the story, he would never have finished it the next year because he was killed in a plane crash that following on uh, January. Um, 
Clement, he was very close to Bob Prince, a pirate announcer. When he came to the Yankees in the 1950s, or when he came to the Pirates in the 1950s, um, he, he couldn't speak English, and um, he was moving to a strange city that he didn't know anybody. And so Bob Prince took him under wing and, and really was very helpful to him in, in adjusting to moving to Pittsburgh. Well, at the end of the 1972 season, Clemente invited Bill and his wife and Bob Prince and his wife and the other um, pirate announcer, Nellie King, and his wife to, to visit them in Puerto Rico. And uh, they were sitting at dinner one night and Clemente said, I have a gift for Bob Prince. So he went in the other room and came back with the silver bat that he'd won the batting title with in 1961 and gave that to Bob Prince as a gift thanking him for all that he had done for him. Just as an aside story, or a couple of aside stories, there were a couple of players who were expert at hitting foul balls. And you'd wonder what would be so, so wonderful about that. Lou Gaffling was one of them who was with the Chicago White Sox and Richie Ashburn with the Philadelphia Phillies. But the method in their madness was that they pit, they'd keep hitting foul balls until they got the pitch that they wanted. And, uh, and it improved their batting average that they were able to, to do that. Well, Richie Ashburn one day was uh, playing and he hit a foul ball into the stands and it hit a woman in the head. And they carted her off to the hospital and. Ashburn felt terrible about it. He found out where, what hospital she was at. So the next day he, he went to visit her and apologize. When he went into her, her room, he noticed her leg was in a cast. And he said, I, I thought you got hit in the head. And she said, I did, but as they were hauling me off, he hit another foul ball that broke my leg. <laughs> unrelated story. Um, Branch Rickey was a famous name in baseball. Uh, Branch Rickey um, was a general manager who um, hired Jackie Robinson, first black ball player. And Branch Rickey II was a, an executive with the Pittsburgh Pirates for a number of years. Well, Branch Rickey III was applying for a job with the Cincinnati Reds. And Marge Schott was the owner of the Cincinnati Reds, and she always wanted uh, to be involved in hiring anybody. And so she didn't really recognize uh, the Branch Rickey name, but um, she was interviewing uh, Branch Rickey III. And she had her dog with her, and he noticed a bag of dog food uh, I-A-M-S, I am's dog food. And he said, does your dog eat I am's dog food? And she said, it's the only thing he'll eat. It's the best dog food in the world. He said, well, my, my grandfather started that company. She said, your grandfather started that company? You're hired. Anybody who's part of that family's got to have something on the ball. <laughs> so he, he always, Branch Rickey III always talked about how he got hired, not because his father and grandfather were legends in baseball, but because his other grandfather was made dog food. <laughs> <laughs> Bill loved a good story, and I'd like to share some of them with you. When we were kids, the New York Yankees had a, and, and there was Bill with Chuck Feeney, the president of the National League, and uh, there was a picture that Roberto sent to my son, Pat. I won't come back to that in a, little, in a few minutes. But um, when Bill and I were kids, Fond du Lac had a Class D farm club for the New York Yankees, Fond du Lac Panthers. And we were both big baseball fans. And we were, I was very young. Bill was uh, three years older than I, but we'd get to as many um, 
games as we as we could. And our favorite player was a guy by the name of Joe Muffaletto. He, he just seemed to have a name like a ball player. Well, one day after <coughs> Bill had left the Pirates and was now at the Baseball Hall of Fame, um, he got a phone call. And this guy said, uh, I don't know if you can help me or not. He said, my name is Frank Muffaletto. He said, and years ago, I had an uncle that played minor league ball. He said, I never could find out anything about him. I wondered if you, you could help me out. Bill said, that'd be Joe Muffaletto. He played second base for the Fond du Lac Panthers in the Wisconsin State League in 1942. Batted just under 300 and uh, was a good fielder. <laughs> the guy said, geez, you guys know everything. <laughs> I think he thought any name that he brought up, he'd be able to <laughs> tell him. I don't think Bill ever told him how he knew about Joe Muffaletto. Um, Bill had a sports writer from Connecticut visit him one time, and the fellow said, uh, do you know Kenny Smith? And Bill said, well, Kenny is a good friend. I, he, when he retired, I replaced him I, as public relations director. And he, he said, in fact, my wife and I bought their house and they moved to an assisted living place. Well, this guy said, years ago, my wife and I uh, came to the Hall of Fame and Kenny was very kind. He showed us around uh, the place and then he said, would you like to have lunch with my wife and I? He said, I'll call my Emmy and ask her to make some sandwiches. Well, the guy said, that'd be wonderful. <coughs> so they, they went over to Kenny and Emmy's house and she made lunch for them and after lunch, this writer said his wife got up and went in the kitchen to, to do the dishes. And Emmy said, Kenny, of all the women, all the people that you've invited over here for, for lunch, this is the first woman who's offered to do the dishes since Joe brought that blonde girl here. <laughs> and he said, what, who are we talking about? She said, you know, Joe DiMaggio. Well, Bill couldn't imagine Marilyn Monroe in his kitchen doing the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> um, during Hall of Fame week, the, every year the new players are inducted into the Hall of Fame and um, the existing members of the Hall of Fame, usually about 30 of them come back for the, so it's a very festive event. And one day, uh, Ted Williams was was coming out of the Adasaga Hotel, which is where all the players stayed, with his fishing equipment. He was going fishing in the morning the, the day before the induction ceremony. And he looked at a long line of people outside the hotel, and Bill was just coming on the scene, and so he called Bill over and he said, what, what is this with all this lineup of people? And Bill said, well, two of the old Hall of Famers are signing autographs this morning, and those, some of those people have been there waiting all night to stand in line to get an autograph. So Ted Williams said, could you watch my fishing equipment for a while? So Bill stood there and he went down the line and he signed an autograph for everybody standing in line. <coughs> um, Lou Gehrig was a baseball hero who applied, uh, appealed to everyone. And uh, a fellow by the name of Pete Sheehy was working for the Yankees and he said the first time when Gehrig reported to the Yankees in 1923, he brought along a lunch bucket with a sandwich that his mother had prepared for him. And she had told him, Lou, you're a Yankee now. We'll take care of lunches for you. <laughs> um, Lou Gehrig was dying of amyotropic lateral sclerosis, which has become known as Lou Gehrig's disease. But they had Lou Gehrig Day for him in 1940, and his teammates gave him a trophy inscribed with how, what they thought of him. And uh, Lou Gehrig was never one for making speeches, but um, after this festive day when everybody honored him, he said, you've been reading a lot about a bad break that I got, but to, today I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. Well, when Bill got to the Hall of Fame, he thought that that trophy that his ball players gave uh, to him in 1940 would be a great item to 
for the Hall of Fame to have. So he wrote to Mrs. Gehrig and asked her if she'd consider donating it to the Hall of Fame. Never heard from her. But a couple of years later, he came back to his office one day and found a package on his desk. It was from Eleanor Gehrig's attorney. And he opened it up and it was a, a trophy that his players had given him in 1940 and with a note from the attorney saying that Mrs. Gehrig had died and she left a note for him that saying after her death to send the, send the trophy to Bill. So they have a, a, a beautiful item in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Um, Bill got a call one day from a fellow who was uh, a woodcarver and he said he'd carved a life-size statue of Babe Ruth out of one block of wood with, with the Hall of Fame be interested in it. Well, the Hall of Fame never buys anything. People either donate it or, or they sell it to somebody else. But Bill said he'd be interested in seeing this, so the guy said, I'll send it out to you to, that you can look at. Well, the statue was unbelievable. It looked like a, an exact uh, replica of Babe Ruth from the ward on his nose to veins in his hands and uh, out, of, out of one block of wood. So uh, Mrs. Clark, one of the benefactors of the Hall of Fame, bought, bought the statue and donated it to the Hall of Fame. And Ruth, Babe Ruth's daughter came for the dedication of the, the statue. Well, not long later, Bill got another call from the artist and he said, I did another statue of Ted Williams. Well, knowing the quality of the statue of the other one, Bill was really anxious to see it. And again, it was a terrific image of Ted Williams and Mrs. Yockey, the owner of the Boston Red Sox, purchased it and donated it to the Hall of Fame. And they invited Ted Williams there for the unveiling of the statue. Um, they took the covering off the statue and Bill looked over at Ted Williams and he was crying. Uh, it was so, it looked so much like him. If they ever gave a trophy to the toughest ball player in baseball, they should consider Buck Martinez, who was a pitcher for the Boston, the Toronto Blue Jays in 1986. Um, they were in the field and Gorman Thomas was batting and Bill Bradley was on first base and Gorman had a long ball to the outfield. And Bradley circled the bases and come, <coughs> coming all the way home. Well, but the ball arrived, arrived a, couple, a couple seconds before Bradley did. But he literally ran right over Bar Martinez, breaking his leg and dislocating his ankle. But Martinez held onto the ball and the umpire called him out. Well, in the meantime, Gorman Thomas was running around the bases and uh, Buck Martinez was lying on the, on the ground and threw the ball to third base to try to get Gorman Thomas out at third. Well, he threw wild and so Gorman Thomas headed for home. And the ball again arrived a few seconds before Gorman Thomas did. Gorman Thomas piled into Martinez but he held onto the ball and he made a, the double play unassisted and they hauled him off to the hospital on the stretcher. <laughs> um, well, I'd like to add a couple baseball stories of my own. Um, I would go to some of the national conventions for uh, national sport collectors conventions. I went to several of them in Chicago and one in St. Louis and one in Cincinnati, and there you'll find uh, hundreds of dealers, some of them just selling uniforms, some just selling autographs, some just selling Milwaukee great stuff, some selling football stuff, and many of them selling cards or buying cards. Um, so a, a couple of the things I picked up, one was uh, the rookie contract for Gaylord Perry who was a, a pitcher and ended up being in the Hall of Fame, but this was a, his contract from the first year when he went into baseball in 1962. 
what would you think they would have played, paid a pitcher who ended up being in the Hall of Fame in 1962? $15,000 in this contract. Um, another interesting thing in baseball was in 1932, the New York Yankees were playing the Chicago Cubs and Babe Ruth came to bat and many people thought that he took the bat and pointed to the outfield uh, and then hit a home run. Mm -hmm. But there was others who thought that he took the bat and pointed to the dugout because there were some of the Yankees who were harassing them and they thought that he was gonna hit the ball into the dugout. <laughs> so Charlie Root was pitching for the Cubs and this young fellow wrote to Charlie Root and he said, this was in 1965, since you were, dear Mr. Root, since you were pitching when Babe Ruth hit his famous called shot home run in the 1932 World Series, I wonder if you could give me your comments on this home run. I read somewhere that he merely pointed at the Cubs dugout, indicating he would foul off the next pitch there. Is this true or did he really call his shot? I would appreciate an answer to this letter very much. And Charlie Root sent the letter back with a note at the bottom and he said, Babe Ruth did not call a shot. If he had pointed as they say, he would have been knocked on his spanny. Signed, Charlie Root. <laughs> uh, one of the national conventions that I went to, uh, I had a friend in West Bend who was also a base baseball nut who collected things, baseball items. And uh, we decided to go to the convention together. We were going on Friday and Saturday and coming back Sunday in Chicago. And the convention was being held downtown in Chicago, so we, we decided to take the train. I picked him up in West Bend. We parked the car in Milwaukee and took the train to Chicago. Well, Tony had a, a nice collection of the old baseball cards that were tobacco cards. Back in the early 1900s, tobacco companies put out cards of the, the picture of the players or players on. And Tony had a, a quite a elaborate collection of them. So he said, the time has come, I've got to sell these cards because um, he had just been married recently and they were look, he and his wife were looking at buying a house. He said, I've got to get some money together for a down payment. So we got to the hotel where the convention was and Tony is running around <coughs> the <coughs> sales area uh, trying to find somebody interested in buying his cards. And he finally, the next day, uh, Saturday, he did the same thing and he finally found a, one of the dealers that was interested in his cards. And Tony said, well, how much will you pay me for them? And the fellow talked to him and he said, I'll give you $9,000 for them. Tony said, sold. The guy reached in his briefcase and got a lot of $100 bills and peeled off $90, $100 bills, gave them to Tony. Well, that night in our, in our room, he, he was laying out all this money on his bed and he'd sold some other stuff. So he came up with $10,500. I said, Tony, I don't know if you thought about this, but tomorrow morning we're heading for the Chicago Northwestern Depot. It's not in a very nice area of Chicago. And you've got $10,500 in cash you're carrying around with you. I said, geez, I never thought about that. So the next morning when Tony and I headed to the train station, Tony had $5,250 in each of the socks that he was wearing. <laughs> There was a longtime writer in New York, uh, Paul Gallico, who was a sports writer, and um, he wrote an article called His, His Majesty the King, which is my favorite sports story. Uh, Paul Gallico later left the sporting area and became a novelist, a, a well-known novelist, winning awards for his novels. But I'd like to read you the, the story of his Majesty the King. Paul Gallagher said, there was a handsome kid aged around 12 or 13, son of a pleasant 
middle-class suburban family who had undergone an operation. The operation had been successful, but the boy failed to improve. He had slipped too far downhill. Something tremendous was needed to bring him back. The boy's idol was Babe Ruth. A baseball autograph by the Babe might prove the right stimulus to quicken that nearly extinct flame. A newspaper man went to Ruth and told him the story and asked him to autograph a baseball for the boy. The next morning, the nurse came into the room and said, Johnny, Johnny, you must open your eyes and sit up for a moment. Someone is here to see you. The door opened and it was God himself who walked into the room straight from his glittering throne. God dressed in a camel's hair polo coat and a flat camel's hair cap. God with a flat nose and little piggy eyes, a big grin, and a big flat black cigar sticking out of the side of it. God gave his alias his Babe Ruth, and he sat at the foot of the bed and talked baseball as man to man for a little while with the earth child, and then promised him a personal and private miracle all for himself. He said, you know what I'm going to do this afternoon? I'm going to hit a home run just for you. You watch. It's going to be your home run. Now you hurry up and get well so you can come out and see me play. When he left, the boy knew that God had been there because he left a shiny white American League baseball with the familiar Babe Ruth traced on the horse in ink as evidence of his presence. And what is more, he performed the miracle. He hit that home run that afternoon. How did he know that he would be able to do it? R Ruth always seemed to know. The boy could not die after that, not after he had thus been held close to the august breast of divinity and been a party to a genuine grade A special number one miracle. I'll, I'll close by, uh, my, my brother died several years ago and at his funeral, his son Kevin gave the eulogy and Kevin said that um, of the hundreds of cards that his fam that their family received, the one thing that most people said was how kind that Bill was. Everybody said how kind he was. And Kevin told the story of <clears throat> when Bill was with the Pittsburgh Pirates, a young fellow just out of college who was working for a magazine that nobody had ever heard of came to the ball game and asked Bill if he could get an interview with Roberto Clemente. And Bill arranged for him to meet and get an interview with Clemente. And he also arranged for him to sit in the press box, found him a seat in the press box. And some of the old sports writers for the Pirates resented this. They thought that that this young kid who nobody ever heard of, who represented a magazine nobody ever heard of, uh, shouldn't be given the same privileges that they, that they were given. Bill said, everybody's treated the same. So then Kevin said, 20 years later, when Bill was at the Baseball Hall of Fame, Bryant Gumbel, perhaps remembering how kind Bill was to him when he was first a novice sports writer, brought the entire Today Show to the Hall of Fame and set up their show under Bill's office window. Wow. Wow. I have just a couple other things to show you. Um, when Bill joined the Baseball Hall of Fame, President Reagan invited all the Hall of Famers to the White House for lunch. Bill was along with him. It was interesting because this was in April 28th 1981, I believe. Three days later is when President Reagan was shot. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a notice that they put in the Pittsburgh paper when announcing that Bill was leaving Pittsburgh to go into the Baseball Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. That was the Adesaga Hotel on Lake Adesaga, and that White House is the house that Bill lived in. These are a couple of pictures that I told you about going to the uh, National Convention. Um, Bobby Thompson was there one day signing autographs, and so this was a picture of his, his uh, home run in, in 1951. 1951, the uh, J. 
Giants and the Dodgers were tied for first place and they had that one playoff game to decide who was going to the National League for the National League and the World Series. Bobby Thompson hit a home run in the ninth inning to win the game for the, for the uh, Giants. And this was the 1960 World Series where Bill Mazeroski hit the game-winning home run in the ninth inning to uh, win the seventh game of the World Series for the Pirates against the Yankees. Does anybody remember Bob Hazel? Yeah, Yankees. Bob, Bob Hazel, in 1957, the, the uh, Milwaukee Braves were um, hoping to get into the World Series, but their outfielder, Bill Druten, was injured and he was out for the year. Bob Hazel had played for some other major league team for a couple games in 1955. And apparently he was at the, with the uh, Briggs farm team. So they brought him up to replace Bob, uh, the Billy Bruton. And Hazel went nuts. He batted 403 during the time that he, he was with the, with the Braves and helped them win the, uh, get into the series and win the series. The next year he didn't make the team. He played for about 20 games and was batting about 130. And, they let him go, and those were the only games he ever played, but for that brief moment in his life, he was, uh, for 43 games that he played with the Milwaukee Brewers, he batted 403. The end. Thank you for your attention. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah. Of all the people and characters in baseball that Bill knew, who, who would you think made the biggest impression on you? What single person? Who made the biggest impression on him? I think Clemente. Clemente? Yeah. Because of what he did on the field or off the field? I, I think both. <coughs> the way he, he died, he had, <coughs> uh, he had sent a, a, a trainload of food to people that were destitute in Nicaragua. And he was disappointed because the, the really needy people didn't get the food. And so he, he raised the money for another plate and wanted to go along himself to see that those who needed the food got it. And that's when the plane went down. So he was a, he was a, a, a gener generous thinking person. Yes. yes. Well, I, um, had they been closer to Fond du Lac, I, I did get to some of the uh, some of the ball games, but only when we were out there visiting for a couple of days. Uh, Bob Fischel, Bob Fischel, his boss was a major fellow, so that my my dad got a. a, a Pass for every game, but I don't think my dad ever got to a game. <laughs> but he loved, he loved having that. that uh, yeah. I've been to a few baseball games in my life. I've been to three or four Timber Rattler games, but I've never been to a Brewers game or any other baseball game besides the Timber Rattlers games. And, but, and I enjoyed going because you know, it's. When you go to a baseball game, you enjoy getting out of your house, watching them, watching it in person instead of watching the ball game on TV. Because TV doesn't show you everything. Well, that's right. They, they have a good team, Timber Rattlers. Yep. Any other questions? Well, thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.